Democracy That Delivers is brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. Now to your host, Ken Jakes. Hi, everybody. This is Ken Jakes. I'm the host of Democracy That Delivers, our podcast here at SITE. And I'm joined by Effie Shalamash. Did I say that right? I'm sure I messed it up. Ephraim Shalamash. There you go. I'm going to let you introduce yourself. <laughs> there you go. So, but- what a great start, Ken, for a terrific radio interview. I think just for that, I would give you the the Oscars. Thank you very much. But but we're going to go by Effie. Okay. So, which you go by, right? Let's do that. Let's go that. Uh, but anyway, you're the senior advisor at Duffin Phelps, and you also lead the firm's Israel practice. And are you in Tel Aviv now, or are you in New York? I'm actually in the states right now, you are, as you okay. know. As you know, Ken, I split my time between uh, Tel Aviv, Europe, and, and New York, and uh, I'm in the states right now. Okay, uh, in New York City. And uh, have you been here since COVID, or have you gone back and forth a little bit? I've been here since COVID, as you know, traveling to the Middle East in general. It's, it's been very a difficult. challenge, and specifically, Israel has been. Uh, has been uh, a little bit tricky. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Are you from Israel originally? Are you uh, from the States? Or Yes, I uh, I was born in Israel, born and raised. And uh, I moved to the States many years ago following university and my military service. I moved to the States and uh, I've been both in academia and, and business since I moved to the States. And w- uh, did you go to school here or in Israel? Both. I went to school both in Israel and in the States. I have a PhD from University of Michigan, so I got a chance to uh, go blue and spend a few years in the great city of Ann Arbor. Yeah, a great hockey school. My son is a very good hockey player, and that's uh, one of the schools that he would love to go play at. So. <laughs> very good school. And uh, where'd you go to law school? I went to law school in, in Israel. Uh, Barlan University, and then I also I have legal degrees from University of Michigan as well. Okay, and what did you do before you uh, started working at Duffin Phelps? So I practiced law for a few years with uh, various global international law firms, and then I started my academic career. I've been teaching at uh, NYU for the last couple of years, and at the same time developing my advisory practice. And I had the privilege to join the leadership of Duffin Phelps a few years ago as a senior advisor and the head of the Israel practice. And you're also a fellow there, correct, at the Institute? Correct. We started our uh, Global Institute last year, and I'm one of the fellows at the Institute. So have you started teaching for your fall uh, semester yet, or is that uh, after Labor Day? We actually just started teaching last uh, week. So um, certain schools start a little bit early, before Labor Day, and I'm one of them. Are you teaching in the law school or in another department? I'm teaching at the law school, but most of my uh, courses are actually open to business students as well because oh, the terrific. courses are interdisciplinary. Yeah. So both MBAs and law students get a chance to take my seminars and courses. Now, is NYU, are they going back physically or is it all in a virtual environment? So some of, uh, some of them are hybrid and uh, some of them are virtual. My classes are mainly virtual. They are. Okay, terrific. Well, let's get started. We wanted to talk about direct investment in national security, which is something we've really not talked about here at SITE, especially on the podcast. So why don't you, first of all, kind of define what we mean by the broadened definition of national security that includes direct investment? Because, you know, normally we're, we're used to the traditional uh, definition of national security and what that means. But but tell us a little bit where you're kind of going with this. National security in 2020 means something very, very different. In the past, we focused on military and intelligence elements. Now in 2020, national security covers many different components from national infrastructure, strategic assets, uh, cyber infrastructure, data as a leading assets of the economy, access to digital data, personal data. Since there are so many different components, it requires a comprehensive approach to national security. And since here we focus on the nexus between foreign direct investments, markets, and national security, we have to understand policymakers, government officials, and of course, business people who drive deals in this space, that uh, investing in a market requires understanding of the various national security components. 
All right. I know this is a very good definition. And especially now as we move into COVID and post-COVID world, a lot of things like healthcare, medical supplies, personal health, digital data, that sort of thing is playing into the equation, correct? Correct. So many countries, uh, of course, United States was the leader, but many others followed in the developing economies, followed the states and uh, reformed their national security and foreign direct investment rules. And that mainly covered uh, sovereign investors, technology companies, uh, strategic tech sectors. But I think one of the conclusions or the lessons from the COVID era is that we need to expand the definitions and to make sure that we think about national healthcare systems hospitals, healthcare providers, access to digital data, healthcare data uh, is part of the definition of national security in this space. So let's go directly into foreign investment, direct foreign investment, and uh, how that is part of national security and indeed maybe even threats to national security. Since the globalization era started, people focused on trade, but actually over the last couple of years, foreign investment is going up way faster than, than global trade. And at SIP, since uh, we focus a lot on economic development and international trade, I think foreign direct investment is a very important part of the story. And when you have bilateral foreign direct investment, you always ask yourself, if, of course, what are the economic uh, motives or the interests behind the transactions and how it's going to foster economic growth in the target economy? Of course, if you invest in, in the defense sector, aerospace, satellite, the national security component is clear, but quite often you invest in, in many other parts of the economy and you don't necessarily think immediately about national security. And that's where uh, special uh, agencies and governmental agencies come in because they have a, a more comprehensive approach to national security and, and trade and investment. And they can point out uh, what's real, what's not, where are the real national security threats and whether certain mitigation and other elements are needed. Well, there's a political component to this as well that needs to be coupled with, uh, with direct foreign investment. And we talked a little bit in our pre-interview before we did the podcast, and I know we don't want to really talk about China too much, but one of the things we look at here at SIP is a phenomenon called corrosive capital, where any regime, any autocratic regime in the world, in particular, the Chinese are very involved in this, the Russians to a lesser extent, but they use direct investment as an extension of their foreign policy. You can see how the Chinese have used that all over the world. And they've really kind of turned the rules of investment upside down as compared to Western foreign investment because they don't have the conditionalities that we require in the, in the West. They can make deals literally overnight. The short term, there could be a win-win situations for both the Chinese and the countries involved. But the risk are very, very high because you can have uh, more corruption involved. A lot of these loans, a lot of these contracts that they set up, they are not paid for. And we've seen, for example, in Sri Lanka, where they built a port for Sri Lanka a few years ago and the government couldn't pay it back. And now China actually owns a part of their sovereign territory. So how does that kind of play into what you're talking about? Ken, there is no doubt that economic nationalism is one of the most fascinating phenomena of, of our century. The fact that we can use economic tools from international trade to bilateral foreign investment and other economic tools to achieve sometimes the same political slash diplomatic goals, uh, if not better. But I think the question is how we can actually differentiate between legitimate concern and noise in the system, over-intervention by political actors. And the same way that Total has been a very well-known economic arm of the French government for many years as a global successful energy company, there are many examples like that. Where well, the U.S. has a lot of examples as well. Absolutely. So it's there. Especially in Central America, South America through the decades. Absolutely. So we see it in the developed world. We see it in the developing world. And then the question, and, and here we're going back to our uh, uh, earlier discussion, how we identify areas where we see over-intervention by political actors, which may lead to some of the concerns that you mentioned before, like corruption, like lack of transparency, like discrimination. I, I'll give you one very obvious example, which I spend a lot of time on, and Duffin Films, of course, is a global company, expanded 
implemented this practice as well. If you look at the sovereign financial world, sovereign finance, at the beginning of the sovereign finance era, there was a concern that many sovereign wealth funds are actually tooled by um, various governments around the world to implement uh, political strategies. Now, it's uh, clearly, we know that most of the funds are actually a very important economic actors to provide liquidity to the market, to diversify risk, and to allow us to uh, get better returns for citizens uh, at large. So I think it's very important to focus on areas and places where clearly the intervention by national governments create this kind of destructive effect or capital that you're referring to. So you mentioned in a couple of notes that you sent to me that governments around the world are adopting new regulatory regimes or revising existing rules to better screen or block foreign investments and strategic assets. What do you mean by that? And how is this a part of this discussion? As I mentioned before, over the last couple of years, many governments, uh, starting with the United States, realized that there is a need to change the way governments uh, screen foreign investments, block sovereign investments, improve the performance of sovereign investments to achieve the kind of economic benefits that we're all looking for and at the same time protecting against national security risk. Some of the regimes like Australia, Canada, Germany, United States, they reformed the rules dramatically to expand the sectors, to expand the procedures, to make sure that more transactions are covered by the new investment review regimes. Some of them, especially in the developing world, uh, even created a whole new regime which didn't exist before. A good example for such an approach is actually India, not necessarily in the developed space, but quite interesting. Uh, just a little bit after the uh, COVID-19 crisis started, they were very concerned about South Asian investments, Chinese investments in the Indian economy, especially when it comes to weak assets companies which are undervalued in light of the COVID crisis, they uh, adopted new rules that make it uh, mandatory to review all these foreign investment transactions in the market. And the reason why I give it as an example is because people were surprised with the uh, very broad uh, coverage of this new regime in India in the sense that it covers all the countries bordering the country, India, and at the same time, all sectors. Because if you look at the rest of the world, countries which try to reform their foreign investment rules, they try to do it strategically, to focus on strategic sectors or the kind of transactions like majority ownership or sovereign governments where there is a real chance of control or real impact on the target market. And here it's been pretty broad. So let's talk a little bit about supply chains and how that affects national security. And we've had a couple of your colleagues come on and, and, and talk about that topic for the entire half hour. From your point of view, how does that affect national security? I mean, the obvious one is pre-COVID, main source or main supply chain comes from China to the United States. And that caused a major problem, especially in healthcare area in terms of supplies. So that's one obvious example. Give us some other ones that you've been looking at. You know, when, when people think about supply chain, so of course, they think a lot about access to supplies, the fact that we diversify our sources, mm -hmm. that we uh, produce in uh, diverse economies, that in times of crisis like COVID, we're able to manufacture ourselves, but at the same time to import if necessary from a diverse pool of sources. But actually, I always think about about it in the wider context, for example, pricing, the ability to get product in the market for affordable prices. I think one of the things we saw since COVID is that even global companies with very effective supply chains where they had diverse sources and they could get to some of these sources quite easily, there was such a price fluctuation that in reality, even in places like United States and its supermarkets, they couldn't get the products they were looking for. And then, of course, we mentioned national security before. You may have a great source as part of your supply chain. But if you are very, very exposed in terms of the strength of your infrastructure, you could be in a, a serious uh, trouble. The, the best example these days is, of course, access to data, IT system, cyber attacks. Uh, what I'm trying to say is that if some of your suppliers are in places where the cyber protection is relatively low, you can have a great supply chain, but people are going to use your third-party suppliers or customers as a way to get to your most sensitive data and your most 
sensitive infrastructure. And that's why, for example, companies like Duff and Phelps have expanded significantly uh, the cyber work with uh, third parties. So when we're talking about threats to national security, which, which I kind of touched upon at the beginning of the, uh, of the uh, podcast, what do you see as the biggest threat to national security when it comes to direct foreign investment? I think that when we look at national security and foreign direct investment today, each country needs to decide what's most important uh, to its economy in terms of national security and national assets. So, of course, different countries have different assets. It all depends which part of the world we're talking about and what kind of sectors they focus on. So, for example, if in a particular country one sector is dominant and it's very important for its economy and you have a foreign investor which is trying to target uh, a significant part of the sector, that uh, raises all types of questions about the risk resilience of the economy. So that's really a kind of a broader interpretation of national security. One example for that is the way the Canadians uh, think about national security, the resilience of the economy and labor markets, where as part of their foreign direct investment review, they also include the uh, protection of local jobs and the resilience of the economy, something that other countries do not do. And then another element, of course, is the, as I said before, IT system, cyber infrastructure. I think that's become a big issue where you can have a great foreign direct investor in an asset where directly there is no risk, but you really have to look very carefully about the identity of the investor and its ability to execute the, the transaction properly and safely. And uh, we're in this COVID environment and uh, the listeners can probably hear the sound of a mower behind me. So they're mowing my lawn right now. <laughs> That's one of the downsides of working in a COVID environment. But anyway, let's talk about Israel. You're over, you've been in over in Israel a long time. You split your time between New York and Israel. And in your notes, you talk a little bit about a peace agreement and between UAE and Israel. And you talk about the nexus between that security, interest in, in commerce and innovation. Tell us what you mean by that. Sure. So Israel and the uh, Gulf states have been uh, doing business for many years now, but it was mainly behind the scene. And unfortunately, because Israel and the UAE didn't have a formal peace agreement, or as some people call it, normalization agreement, they couldn't do it publicly, directly, and definitely it didn't cover all aspects of the economy. What's really exciting about it, Ken, and these are exciting times, for the first time since the early mid-90s, you have a direct peace agreement between an Arab state and Israel, the Jewish state, which will be a very, very warm peace and will cover all uh, sectors and all aspects of the economy, from tourism to financial markets to flights, and I can go on and on. In fact, just today when we were It's a bilateral treaty between the two countries, correct? Right. So today was the first uh, uh, flight ever uh, between uh, Israel and UAE with the U.S. and Israeli officials, and they discussed ways to uh, foster foreign investment from Israel, Israeli companies into the UAE, and, the, and vice versa. And the reason, Ken, why it's so important is because, especially in the Gulf states, the public sector was very, very dominant for many many years. And UAE and other governments in the region like Saudi Arabia and others have been thinking uh, for a long time how to really create a vibrant, successful private sector where you create good paying jobs in private companies. And it's been a challenge in the region for a long time. Israel figured out long ago with the tech ecosystem where you have very high level of innovation, high level of uh, tech companies from AI to cyber and other sectors. So I think the vision here now is to take this model of innovation, ecosystem, tech companies, and to help the Gulf states like UAE to develop a similar approach. So I think over the next couple of months and years, we're going to see uh, funding coming out of many uh, Gulf entities, including Gulf-based sovereign wealth funds and other UAE entities into the Israeli tech ecosystem and also uh, infrastructure assets as well. And vice versa, we're going to see Israeli tech companies very active in the Gulf states. And I think this is very exciting for both nations uh, in terms of jobs creation, economic development, and of course, regional peace. Well, there's two things that come to mind when I listen to you say this. First of all, the 
private sector is leading the way here, and it potentially could lead to a lot of political change as well. And that's something that we talk about at site and work with our partners a lot on. So that, that's very good to hear. The second part is, is this could be kind of a testing ground for other agreements between Israel and, and, and other Gulf states or other Arab states, correct? Absolutely. So this is a real story of private sector taking the lead and then mobilizing the public sector and government. Absolutely, Ken. Yeah. Uh, if you think about the fact that so many companies on both sides of the aisle tried to do business with each other for such a long time, and unfortunately, quite often they were blocked by uh, populism or, or other uh, diplomatic uh, forces, and now for the first time they can actually leverage the private commercial uh, part of the story and bring it to the uh, to the public stage, I think this is uh, really uh, fantastic. And also, this is just the beginning. I think we're going to see, and it's already been reported publicly, we're going to see more and more countries in the region, in the Middle East, in Africa, signing formal peace agreements with Israel. And as I said before, this is not only about preventing uh, military actions and terrorism, it's also a lot about uh, driving innovation, sharing information, Information. And most importantly, frankly, Ken, it's in the context of today's discussion, it's really about bringing more foreign investment to the region, both sides, and at the same time, making sure that the national security of, of both nations, the national security is being protected. Well, what you, what you talk about is very interesting, and we talk about this a lot at site. When countries are involved with each other economically and you have businesses working with each other, you're less likely to have conflict. I mean, this is an old premise that goes back at the end of World War I when they set up the League of Nations and then the WTO. I mean, there's just there's example after example in world history, especially since World War I, where that's the leading premise is if countries do commerce with each other, they're less likely to have conflict. And this is a good example of that. I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. If you look at other nations in the region, for example, Egypt, Jordan, they signed peace agreements with Israel many, many years ago. I'm sure you remember, Ken, the famous uh, Sadat trip to the region in the late 70s yep. and the uh, famous flight of uh, Hussein, the father flying over Israel as part of the uh, peace agreement with Israel. That was a top-down uh, peace agreement in the sense that first the countries signed the peace agreements and only then they tried to drive transactions on the ground. Looking back, I can tell you that it didn't work the way we all hoped in the sense that we didn't see enough private sector uh, and commercial activity because it was really a top-down strategy. But if if it's really driven by transactions on the ground, for example, Israel is now exporting natural gas to Egypt through the same pipeline that Egypt used to export natural gas to Israel years ago. So now when you have a dependency on, on both sides and the companies f- from Egypt and Israel trade natural gas with each other, you have really a, an energy ecosystem that already drives lots of interesting transactions around it. And this is just one example. There are many. No, that's absolutely right. And when you do have that, as you said, codependency, again, the, the, the potential for conflict goes way down uh, when you're tied to each other economically like that. But one thing you mentioned, too, that there's other countries outside of the Middle East that are doing this. You mentioned Africa as well. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So many African countries were interested in the uh, Israeli tech ecosystem and Israeli innovations. And more specifically, as you know, because so many African countries suffered from lack of efficient agriculture, uh, technologies, water issues, access to food, there was a need over the years to bring these two uh, regions together and to bring the Israeli economy closer to many African economies. Some of them, like Kenya, did it very, very well and built great uh, commercial relationship with Israel, including lots of foreign direct investment on both sides. However, some of them, because they were driven by politics and other diplomatic developments in the region, so we didn't see that publicly yet. But I think according to various uh, news reports, I think over the next couple of years, we will see more and more of these countries from Africa getting closer to Israel and the rest of the region. So we're getting toward the end of the podcast, and I want to kind of come full circle on this. I mean, the reason we're talking like this right now is because of COVID. You're not in my office. You didn't make a trip down to Washington so we could do this in a studio. We have to do this virtually right now. So let's get back to original. One of my original questions is COVID, national security, and investment. And 
Where do you see this all playing out? Are, are there any lessons learned that you've seen that both companies and governments uh, have learned from as we move forward to the next phase of this? Absolutely. There are many, many uh, lessons that we learn both in the private sector and on the government level. I think in the private sector, uh, many companies understand that they should start thinking about national security and resilience of uh, companies, supply chain, infrastructure early in the game. So, for example, if you talk about mergers and acquisitions, a national security used to be a component where people start thinking about it only towards the end of the negotiations. Now, people start talking about it uh, early on. And as you know, Duff and Phelps, for example, helps uh, many of these companies to uh, understand a little bit better how to implement this kind of thinking early in the process to make sure that the transaction is successful. And other things that, that people kind of keep in mind as part of this discussion is the fact that uh, you have to think very carefully where you place your people, employees, your operations, because obviously, and as I explained before, national security now means totally different thing. For example, your ability to mobilize employees and to make sure that they are safe and sound. And on the government's level, the examples that I gave before, China, India, some parts of Europe, countries like Hungary, Poland, and others just recently changed their laws to make it uh, much more uh, straightforward from government's perspective to review certain transactions more carefully to make sure that national interests, national infrastructure Everything is well protected, especially now that we're thinking about the second wave of COVID or if we think about other stories like COVID in the future, because COVID already happened. So we know by now how to react. But I think it made people think about the next black swan and the, and the ability to respond more effectively. Well, beyond COVID, you know, this virus will kind of uh, run its course eventually. It may take two years or whatever, year and a half, two years. And and where health-wise, we kind of get back to normal. Uh, But what about things that we've done during COVID that you think is going to be permanent, especially what we've been talking about? I think there is no doubt that foreign direct investment in tech and infrastructure is going to stay as a long-term trend. And I'm not talking uh, only about platforms like Zoom. I'm talking about the ability to perform better in a virtual environment. And that's why sectors like enterprise software has been booming and will continue to go strong. Another thing which we didn't mention so far is, of course, uh, climate change, global warming, and other related risks. So as you said before, I think by now we all understand how to be better prepared for the next wave, for the next disease, because we already understand that this is a mega issue that needs to be addressed on the corporate level, on the the government's level. But I think if you look at the fires in California, for example, uh, you understand that uh, the next uh, crisis might look a little bit different. And I'm an optimist, so I think always think how to use the existing tools, many of them we discussed earlier, in order to help us better prepared for the next crisis. And I think, for example, many of the financial actors that we discussed, like sovereign financial investors and other, can invest more and more in ESG-related assets, in climate change-related assets. And these kind of foreign direct investments will eventually generate not only returns for these particular financial instruments and nations at large, but also I think it will help us be better prepared for the next uh, crisis, which clearly will look very different. I think so. So Effie, it's been a pleasure. We're at the end of the program. It flew uh, by very quickly. I hope you stay in good health and uh, hopefully things will get back to semi-normal very soon. But uh, it was a pleasure having you on and, and let's try to get you back back on in a few months and and see how things have progressed and uh and I think it'd be a lot of fun. Ken, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was terrific. I enjoyed it as well and I'm looking forward to speaking with you soon. Terrific. Thanks a lot and we'll see everybody next week. Democracy that delivers has been brought to you by the Center for International Private Enterprise. For more information, please visit sipe.org. <laughs>